My sermon this morning falls in two parts, one based in the gospel, the other in the epistle, and both are about light shining in darkness. This month has been especially hard for Karen and me. It began with some bad news on December 30th. A friend of our family, but really Karen's longtime childhood friend, went down in an unexplained plane crash. A six-seat Cessna jet took off from Burke Lakefront Airport in Cleveland and climbed in about a minute to 3,100 feet and then suddenly nosedived into Lake Erie, and they were all lost. And they didn't really find anything until after their funeral two weeks later. Karen comes from Columbus, Ohio. That's where the plane was headed. And her circle of friends were and are unusually close. They get together still. They all came together, of course, for the days surrounding the funeral. And they came together to support their friend. And one in particular, the delight of the, there was a father, her husband. Sharon had a husband named Ryan and a daughter named Megan. And those two were lost in this plane crash. Megan is 19 years old. Ryan is her high school sweetheart. So Ryan is also close to Karen and the circle of friends. My family, Karen, Trevor, Jacob, and Carter, all stayed at their home um, in recent years. So three of my children got to know my three children got to know three of their four. And really, um, from around the country, dozens of this same age, 50-year-old friends came together in a very powerful, moving time, a time of deep Christian community, where nobody could escape the, that thought of putting themselves in Sharon's shoes and thinking deeply about what life would be like for her. Especially when everybody went to their usual life, lives, went home, and she entered into a darkness nobody could keep from her. While Karen was in Columbus, though, by date, while she was there, news came to me here of a high school friend of mine named Mark, whose daughter was in a car accident and arrived at the hospital DOA. Now, I'm not that close to Mark. We played soccer together on our high school team, so it's been 39 years since I've last seen or talked with his friend. And I forced myself to write him a note. And in order to do that, I tried to put myself in his place. His daughter was working. There are other things. I've been with two families this month preparing funeral services. Well, in one, a 63-year-old man was diagnosed with cancer out of the blue, and that took him down much faster to death than anyone doctors had initially predicted. Darkness can come suddenly. I can name other situations that have taken me to the place of sympathetic grief. Jerry Sitzer, in his excellent book called A Grief Disguised, which I read this past week again, says that to live is to grieve. It's unavoidable. It's a form of darkness we all must face. There are expected losses and unexpected losses. He says the expected ones happen at intervals, like seasons, such as losing our grandparents, and then our parents, and if we live long enough, we have to say goodbye to a spouse. All people suffer loss. Being alive means suffering losses. And when these occur, we humans experience grief. The unwelcome feelings of pain and loneliness, sorrow, and numbness. Sister's book is about loss, but due to his own Experience, traumatic experience in losing his wife, mother, and two of his children when the car he was driving one night was struck, struck head on by a drunk driver. His book is about sudden losses that could come quite unpredictably. He lists terminal illness, disability, divorce, rape, emotional abuse. 
There's a conceptual abuse, chronic unemployment, crushing disappointment, mental illness, and untimely death. Loss is loss. And no two losses are the same. They need not be compared because each circumstance is unique and the pains of grief incalculable. He writes about the darkness of survivors of traumatic, unpredictable loss are plunged into. I read this book here again, as I say, A Grace to Sky, subtitled How the Soul Grows Through Loss. How the Soul Grows Through Loss. I highly recommend the book. The author kind of had a, a waking dream, actually more like a nightmare, wherein he dreamed of a setting sun and he was running frantically west, desperately chasing the sun to remain in its fiery warmth and light, running towards the horizon. He was losing the race. The sun was going down faster than he could run. And losing light, he sat down and looked east, and he was terrified by the darkness, closing in on him. So he lost hope, he collapsed to the ground and fell into despair. He felt, he said, absolute terror in his soul. A few days later, a friend shared a poem by John Dunn about East and West. On a map, East and West look farthest apart, like opposites, but on a globe, they eventually meet. And the quickest way for Jerry Sitzer to reach the sun in the light of day is not to run west, chasing after the setting sun, but to head east plunging headlong into the darkness until one comes to the sunrise. This is a book about heading east. Intentionally heading east as the only way to move forward. Now, when we come to the gospel writing, reading, we don't know what darkness the people sat in up there in Capernaum which kind of sounds like a, a border town like Brownsville, Texas, right on the border of another country. Countries that didn't get along. Assyria and Syria, right there near Capernaum. No doubt, tribal Middle Eastern groups constantly and unexpectedly swooped down, taking children and plundering villages, leaving many dead. But as far back as the time of Isaiah, we don't know exactly what this darkness is. As far back as the time of Isaiah, those people who lived in Capernaum lived in a land known for its deep darkness. Now, it's very significant to my reading of the text this morning that Jesus' first move was to go to those people. They were stuck in a place called home, and he called them into fellowship, saying, follow me. A personal invitation. I believe, based on this kind of text, he's still calling people into fellowship with him. He himself is God's grace disguised. And I believe Answering his call is the equivalent of heading east. The only way out of their darkness was to accept his call to be with him. For traumatized people, his way is no easy way out of darkness. No quick fixes for some of life's deepest griefs. His invitation to follow is a promise promise of finding light. I hope if you're someone frantically running west after the sun or just sitting in deep darkness that you would readily answer the call of the one who called himself the light of the world and let it dawn on you. Maybe there is hope. Come, follow me. And I have more to say on this, and I'll tend to it in other Sundays in a bit. Now, the second half of my message, 
into what is a more corporate matter brought up in the reading from 1 Corinthians. The New Testament reading this morning speaks of factionalism. Paul's letter to the church he founded at Corinth had a problem of disunity, disharmony. And Jesus was the light of the world who stepped into our darkness to bring salvation and he Yet the very earliest churches we have on record had dissension. We Christians have a long history of fighting with one another. And there isn't a church anywhere that is immune from this. And some, not all of you, have been plunged into an experience of dissension here. I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. I am of Christ. Right from the start there in, Cor in Corinth, a church that started by the Apostle Paul, unhappy division. Those in that last category who claim to be of Christ clearly have the right person but the wrong spirit in which to proclaim him. We're told that some from Clo some of Chloe's people, no doubt trying to be helpful in the situation by seeking the help of Paul, who's really not a part of this church now, he's elsewhere, they tell him what's going on. And in this letter from Paul, he responds, making this very interesting remark. And he makes it in the context of a couple things. It's about how the gospel is proclaimed. If it's just eloquent words and wisdom, people are going to believe because it's eloquent rhetoric. He also is in the setting of a a body of people broken open. And he says this, that when members of the body focus on the wrong things or go about things in the wrong spirit, concerned with things like who's baptism is better than another, then that body, because of its factionalism, can end up emptying the cross of its power. The powerful message of Christ crucified and resurrected loses its power, loses its meaning. Salt has lost its saltiness. Jesus said to his disciples, trust God and trust also in me. When members of a body allow themselves to get sidetracked into various controversies that break their fellowship, the effect can be disabling to that body's functioning as the body of Christ, unable to fully carry out its God-given mission. Now that's a heavy message, but is it true? Can people really inhibit the power of God? The answer is yes. And I'll give you one example from the life of Jesus. And it's here in our Gospel this morning. Matthew really doesn't give us any details as to why Jesus went from Nazareth to Capernaum, except that it was occasioned by, coincided a lot with, the news that John the Baptist had been put in prison. But why Capernaum? Why a Baptist? Luke does. Luke's gospel supplies us some information that Matthew doesn't. He says that what occasioned Jesus' move from Nazareth to Capernaum was a sermon he gave in his hometown, synagogue of Capernaum. He preached a message that displeased some of the folks there, and after church, they pursued him right to the edge of a cliff where they wanted to push him off. But somehow, he eluded them, and he moved right through their midst, and he left for Capernaum. It wasn't just that there were some dissenters, he could handle most of them. There was a deeper reason. And Luke says it this way, he left them because in their unbelief, he could do no great work among them. Their unbelief prevented him from doing miracles, from having his message be heard and have its powerful transforming effect. They didn't trust him. Ministry, my friends, yours, and mine is built on trusting relationships. Trusting relationships. And without them, any, any ministry is like a sailboat without wind, like a gas without car, or like a car without gas. It's a community of believers empty of God's power. Trust. Trust. I believe that God's power is greater than any problem we can God, and as God's people, as praying people, as baptized people in covenant with God, I hope 
each and all of us can be put in touch with that power of God, of God's love and forgiveness and healing, such that he would bring about his will to transform us into one strong expression of the body of Christ through his friendship, ready to fully carry out the mission he's given us. The work of becoming a strong, united church has begun. It is well underway. Make no mistake. We are not running west chasing the sun. I am facing east, seeing the light of dawn. And our vestry is two. Next week we have a new vestry coming together. Support the mission of this church. Support the leaders of this church. Pray for the new vestry in its efforts to move us forward to God's work. Seek peace and walk away from gossip and gossipers. Commit your ways to the Lord. Make yourself vulnerable in the doing of his will. Would you join me in prayer? God, our Heavenly Father and Lord of all, fill all of us with your Spirit. Work in me and in the people of this church the virtues of faith, hope, and love, of forgiveness and mercy, that our fellowship with you would bring us to, to greater love and strengthen fellowship with one another.